Jack, you're very welcome to the Scalex Insider Podcast. I'm really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Uh, the only thing better, Brendan, is if I were there live, then I would be taking down some of those good Irish golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm taking up on that, sir. You're very welcome here at any point. We have some wonderful golf courses. We have been chatting off air. You know intimately our vision is to inspire, connect and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So Jack, as I open up with all of my guests, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? So, you know, if I look back on my life, Brendan, and as you know, I built a half a dozen companies in the US, the national firms. Uh, Most of those were in the financial services, mortgage insurance and that type of thing. if I go back and think about that, uh, whenever I'm building a business, I- I'm interested in making money. But uh, I- I- it goes beyond that. I think you need to understand what the value of- is that you're trying to do. If you pr- if you do it with purpose and build something with value, the money will then follow. But if you're just about the money, then it makes it really scrappy. It makes it tough. So if I look back on my life when I was doing the mortgage business. I was looking for the ways that I could put people in homes that they could afford and make the payments. And the more that I could do that, the more fulfilling it became. And it, and we transcended that beyond me over to the rest of the workforce. What we're involved in is helping families live a good life, right? So that was the purpose. And then we made money along the way. I didn't talk about the money as much as I talked about the purpose. If I look at my last 25 years as a professional speaker, I'm traveling the world. And what I say is, I'm not doing this for the money. Trust me, you're going to pay. But uh, what I'm doing it for is I want to make a difference. I know what needs to be done for a successful salesperson to increase their business. I know what it means to do, to what has to be done for a business owner to increase their business. So um, I had a good ride when I when I was riding it, and now in the last 25 years, my purpose is increase the capabilities of people to really experience what they really have inside of them in building their business, whether they're salespeople, sales managers, or business owners. Oh, I love that. There's so much in that, and we're gonna get into a lot of that today. You indeed give back and you indeed impact others significantly. I'm referencing one of your wonderful books, which we'll dig deep into today, Hyper Seals Growth. You you really touch on, not touch, you explore in this the importance of culture, seeding and undergirding purpose uh, and, and ultimately scaling. But I want to start, we were having some fun off air. I, People who are listening to this podcast who are not maybe familiar with Jack Daly will not will not uh, initially detect, um, and certainly people who are watching this on YouTube will not appreciate uh, the age of the man at the other end of this of uh, this uh, podcast recording. You have an amazing attitude, my friend. You have amazing energy. You have sparked me in terms of this show today. Psyche is the very first principle of our Scalex Ten Principle Framework. So let me start with your track record in running marathons and doing Ironman. What I found out, I mean, you were 46 years of age when you ran your first marathon, 57 when you embarked on uh, competing in Ironman competitions. You've now completed over 93 marathons in 50 states and on seven continents, including the Antarctic. I mean, an incredible feat. Jack, can you share with with our audience a kind of a summary an abridged version of of your other book, you know, the Living Life by Design. What characterizes and and really undergirds your psyche, your mindset? Well, that's a that's a that's a packed question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so let me see if I can distill it down uh, in, into bits. Um, the first one that I would tell you is we got one life to live. Why not live it big versus living it small? And we get to make those choices. Uh, And so I was really benefited, Brendan, um, years ago when I was 13 years old. 
I'm the oldest of five kids. All my siblings are still alive. And to say that we were a middle class family would be overstating it. Uh, we were poor. Um, we had two parents and five kids living in a house with one toilet. Uh, I, my brother and I shared a bedroom. My three sisters shared a bedroom. That type of an environment. And um, and so I went and became a caddy at 13 at the local private club. And on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, guys were arriving in, in nice cars and playing golf during the week. My dad worked six days a week just to feed us. Uh, he didn't have any time for golf. They were arriving in really nice cars and recent vintage uh, and, uh, and and living in big estate homes with built-in pools in their yard. Um, but, uh, now, witness my life, nine passenger station wagon with hundreds of thousands of miles on it in the garage getting fixed more than it's used. My brother never got clothes of his own. He always lived in my hand-me-downs. And uh, and, and we had a swimming pool that fell apart three times every summer because it was just three feet above the ground. And I said, man, there are people living a different life than I am. And if I could choose where I wanted to go, I would go where they are rather than where my dad is. And if he knew the answer to that, he would have already taken that journey. So he obviously isn't the source. So I spent the summer carrying golf clubs and interviewing successful sales successful people, successful people in the community. And I wanted to know how they became successful, what were the five key things they did, what were the things that they made mistakes on, and what advice they would give a 13-year-old. And I compiled all that at the end of the summer. And one of the biggest things, and you're going to really, you're really going to be in sync with this. One of the biggest things was this. You got to have goals. They're not goals unless they're in writing. Don't pick too many. Pick a finality. Pick when they're going to get done, uh, how they're going to get done type of thing. What do you, what do you, how will you know whether you accomplished it? And then the last thing was give it out to as many people as possible because it will increase the pressure on you. Now, I use the word accountability today. So at 13, I picked four sectors of my life, uh, professionally, financially, education, and family, and said, where do I want to be in those four buckets? at 30 years old. And once I had my destination, then it was just a matter of what are the steps needed to get to the destination in those four boxes. Now, here's the real thing I want to share with you. I have been doing that now for 60 consecutive years. Uh, you know, I was prepared for this, for this podcast and I brought this along, but this is with me everywhere I go in life. And in here, are my goals that I set, and they're posted on my website at jackdailysales.com. So the world can see everything I wanted to do in my personal life. But here's the real gig. Look at this thing. I, I write down every single thing I do every day that relates to those goals. And at the end of the month, I have my high activities identified and how I'm tracking month by month. And I can look at where I was last year for a month-to-month, year-to-year lookup. This document I have for 60 years. And it has served you mightily well, my friend. I've, I, I downloaded your, your goals list probably about two years ago, actually, from your website. One, one Christmas, uh, typically we're more reflective at Christmas when we're, when we're envisioning the year ahead and setting goals for the year ahead. And I've come across your work and I download your goals. And what really struck me, I, anyone who knows me would not associate the word lazy with me. You make me sound lazy, Jack. I encourage anyone, to, the listeners to go on and have a look at your goals. It is just phenomenal. Now, cognizant of the fact that we've all 24 hours in a day, it would be remiss of me not to really get underneath how you go about uh, setting your goals. You've talked about the four areas of your life. Is that still relevant since you were 13? And, you know, you've showed your, your diary there. How do you go about planning those goals? Is that is that an annual, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily? You know, give us some insight to that, Jack, in terms of that process. Yeah, so, so Brandon, you mentioned uh, my most recent book, 
Um, it's Jack Daly's Life by Design. And I wrote this during the pandemic. It's a book that I had planned on writing all along. Um, it's the first of 10 books that I've written that are not about business. It's about how to optimize your life intentionally, leading an exceptional life without jeopardizing the success in your business. Um, no matter what your role is in business, they're, they're, they, are, they are compatible together. But unfortunately, too many people prioritize the, whatever they're doing in their business life and then their life uh, personally are the table scraps um, that are left over type of thing. I think that's upside down. I love what I do as a business person. I have uh, my whole life. Um, but I really view the business as being something that gives me the fuel to lead this incredible, exceptional life, right? And so uh, uh, I, I say to people, what is it that is important to you? What do you want your life to be? If I get in front of an audience and ask, how many people by a show of hands want to be more successful than they are already? You know, every hand is up. But then if I leave the stage with a mic and say, hey, so what's success mean to you? Now it's crickets. Now, if you can't tell me what success is, then my guess is whatever you worked on last week didn't get you further down the road. You have to know what success means to you. And success is personal. I make no judgments in terms of whether you're right or wrong. Uh, but uh, too many people are planning a week's vacation and they do it in detail. But and when I ask them what about their life, then I got crickets. They're, they're, they don't have anything. So uh, I will sit down with my wife and say, what is it that you want to do next year? What do I want to do next year? And then we'll merge the list and some things won't make it because we've got too many conflicts, but we're also going to look as the year goes on for opportunities to go a little bit further uh, and give us some bonuses in the year, right? And then we're, we're just gonna target and, and put dates on it. And um, I, I will tell you that uh, travel is a very big thing for me in my goals at this stage of my life. So if you were to go to my website, and look at my goals, you would see probably 15 different destinations from a travel standpoint around the world. And um, I, I put the date that I want to go there. I, 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 buy, I buy the plane tickets. I, 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 I make the reservations for the hotels. And I'm financially invested. I'm committed. Uh, and so when someone calls us and says, uh, we want to hire Jack to speak to our salespeople, uh, if they pick a date that I've already picked for my personal life, what you hear from my from my team is he's booked that day. He's already booked, and and so um, they'll look for another date that works for the company. But but I, I, I I've got my priorities right. It's it's about optimizing my life. I love that optimizing your life. What other what other categories? have you there in which you align your your goals to yeah so so the, the so the first the first category of all is family uh time to be spent with family right so i have two children they're adults now 51 and 44 uh years old i have grandkids uh my wife has has, has a, a grandchild and two daughters uh, we came together late in life uh, after I lost my first wife of 47 years to cancer. And, and so we, we're both busy people. We both have businesses. My wife runs a very large business worldwide. And so we've got commitments to our business. So we have to coordinate all the things that we want to do. And first and first priority is I need to spend time with my kids and grandkids. And so does she. I am on the West Coast in the U.S., um, one of my kids and grandkids are back on the East Coast, yeah. so it requires some some navigation. Uh, uh, the second item that's on my goals is health. If I don't prioritize my health, then I'm not going to be a la around for the long haul. I, I you know I have a I have a one year old grandchild. I, I have a 14 year old, and I have a bunch in between. But I've said to every one of my grandkids, if you guys want to run a marathon at some point. Grandpa Jack is in. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing with that. 
I'm 73, soon to be wow. 74. If we have a one-year-old, I don't think that they should be running a marathon until they're at least 14 or 15. So let's just take 14. That's 15, 14 years from now. That's 87. If I don't prioritize my exercise, prioritize what I'm eating, I'm, I'm not going to be around being able to do a marathon with them, right? That's just a small little thing. Uh, if, if you if, if people go to my website and look at my bucket list, which is has over 400 items on it, one item on there is I'm going to live to 125. And I put that on my bucket list at 28 years old. And people laughed at me then. Now people are saying, this, this guy might actually pull this shit off. Right? Yeah, well, given the man that's sitting in front of me, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. So... You're just past middle age, let's say now, but uh, let let's you know let's let's tune into this because we're very much aligned. I'm of the uh, strong belief, and health and well-being is my first priority. It's the enabler for everything else. If I'm not healthy and well, and I'm not available for my business, my team, my family, and my friends, you know, everything becomes more challenging if my health and well-being isn't optimized. So we're absolutely aligned. How, how important do you feel, you know, we've touched on it already, you know, physical and mental health and well-being is to the scale-up leader? Uh, I do CEO coaching around the world over the phone. And I started doing that five years ago when my wife, Bonnie, got cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer stage four, which we knew was you know, a life ender. And I stayed home. I benched myself and stayed home during that process. Uh, and it, it's been a really remarkable thing uh, for me to learn in doing my coaching with CEOs that how few are prioritizing taking care of their self. Uh, I hear this uh, there aren't enough hours in the day with everything else I've got going on. And the analogy I give is, well, you do a lot of flying because you're active as a business person. So do you ever notice before the plane takes off, um, they tell you, even if you've got kids sitting beside you, if those oxygen masks fall out of the ceiling, put yours on first. Because if you don't take care of yourself first, you won't be able to take care of the others. Um, I know that there, there's, there's too much science, Brendan, that's available to us. I know for a fact that you can handle stress better if you take care of your mental and physical being. Um, and, um, and my dad acquired Alzheimer's before they had a name for it, before he was 50 years old. And in studying that and trying to push that out into my future if it ever arises, uh, I know that taking care of myself physically um, is is a deterrent to Alzheimer's. Uh, I also know that keeping my mind active is a, a deterrent to the Alzheimer's and gives me a higher quality of life for a longer period of time. So as an example, last year I read 104 books. Um, if I were to take out my calendar right now, I could tell you uh, by looking up that, you know, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 books right now. 90% um, of those books are probably business books, and I'm not really running a business, but I love the world of business, and I'm a better coach, and I'm a better speaker trainer um, if, I'm, if I'm up to speed and ahead of the curve uh, with all of that type of thing. So, so I'm, I'm processing two books a week, uh, uh, making sure that this is working really well. And then I can tell you that I'm up at five in the morning, every morning. Uh, I have a gym at my home that I work out in. And I do have something called the Daily Double, which is uh, working out in the morning for an hour to two, and then at the close of the day, working out for another hour to an hour and a half. So it's somewhere in the three to four hours a day type of thing. So here's the thing. Everybody starts the week equal. It's called 168. We all have 168 hours. When you look at people that are getting more done than you, they're not getting more done than you because they have more hours. It's how they use their hours. So I'm very particular about my hours. I, I, I know 
time is money. How you spend your time is how you spend your money. And so you have to be very protective of it. Uh, I wake up and have a to-do list every day. I think that's pretty normal for people. But you can't get on the phone with me unless you have an appointment. I don't take my, uh, if the phone rings right now, it will not be answered. Uh, it's by appointment only. Uh, I, I, I am so disciplined about my time. Now, when I'm disciplined about my time, one of the things that I will not negotiate or compromise is my exercise. Now, if I'm home, it's easier than on the road. And I'm on the road more than 50% of the year. But, you know, all you need to have is running, running shorts and a running shoes. Um, it isn't like you need to bring the gym with you. Uh, sure, I'd like to bring my bike, and sure, I'd like to do this and that. But I, uh, you know what? If I'm in Dublin, I'm going to run that city, and I can tell you more about the streets of Dublin than most anybody that lives in Dublin, uh, <laughs> because I've been there so often, and I'm just I'm not a running maniac when I'm on the road. Uh, and you know, it's uh, it's crazy hours, and it doesn't matter. Uh, it's it's not something that I can negotiate on. I, I love that. Again, we're absolutely aligned. I've seen so many wonderful countries. We had, you know, I've had the privilege of traveling across six continents as we scaled our business, and uh, and I took the opportunity to to run uh, in whatever country I was in. I would ask the hotel concierge first thing in the morning, give me a five k running route. Uh, they would direct me, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's 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 a wonderful way to see a city and a wonderful way to start the day. And it literally requires you to pack a pair of trainers and a pair of shorts. And, uh, you know, so there's really, whether it's a walk, a run, a jog, whatever, uh, there's, there's, for me, there was no excuse. It, uh, it was just part and parcel of the way, the way by I travel. By the way, you're, by the way you're, you're so much kinder than me. Um, <laughs> like, like for you to say, hey, give me a 5K route. And I'm like mentally going, <laughs> Five K. What is it? A whip? But, you know, but but you're being courteous to your listeners and your viewers in saying, "Hey, don't don't do this, Jack. Don't tell them, hey, go out and do ten miles or a half marathon in the morning." I I, 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 I am in agreement with you, though. The speed doesn't count. Yeah. But I love the journey. Yeah, I know absolutely. I look at it would have largely depended on what I was training for at the time. Before we move into the uh, you know the, the, the developing high performing sales teams i'm always looking for little hacks and you know in terms of you managing that managing your time so you optimize your energy so you for scaling and i mean you have you are a prolific scaler what are some of the 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 uh, things that you have in place which you could not do without uh, in terms of enabling you to optimize your life? Oh, what a great question. Uh, the first order of business is HPAs, high payoff activities. What we need to understand is in our business life and in our personal life, have we really understood what are the things that we should be working on that will make the difference, the positive difference? What are those high payoff activities? And identify what those high payoff activities are. Uh, and then, then coupled with that is the word leverage. How can I get more done with less work? Uh, now, here is the answer to that. If you don't have an assistant, you are one. There are things that need to be done in life, but not necessarily done by you, right? So look, I'm, I'm, I don't say this from a bragging or pat myself on the back. I'm, I'm trying to educate here, but I'm ranked in the top 1% in the National Speakers Association of income earners as a professional speaker. And, and people that are other speakers view me as a bit of a role model. But they're confused because they say, how does the guy have the time to race these marathons, these Ironmans, write these books, go on all these holidays, doing all this crazy fun stuff? 
There's only so many hours in the day, right? I just don't know how he gets it all done. Well, the real, the real answer to that is because I'm not working on things that you're working on. So as an example, uh, I travel somewhere in the neighborhood of 250,000 air miles a year. Now, that's airplanes, that's rental cars or, um, uh, or Ubers, uh, it's hotels, and, uh, and I'm terrible, Brendan, with technology. Uh, like I, I, I don't even own a laptop. I don't travel with an wow. iPad or a laptop. I, I, I can barely function with this thing, okay? Wow. But this is all I travel with. But, but my competitors, the other speakers, they'll sit and book their own travel. Now, every moment that you're on a computer booking your own travel, that's part of your 168 hours of the week. Um, if I do a presentation, uh, I'm going to have a handout for that presentation. Sometimes it'll be one page, sometimes it'll be 40 pages. I'm not going to sit at a computer and make that 40 page workbook. Uh, uh, it would take me the rest of my year to do that. And it would look like a kindergartner performed it. Uh, it's not a high function for me to be doing. So I have a team of assistants. I have no employees, but I have a team of assistants and they all have been with me for over 10 years. They're all in, working out of their homes. They all do different things. And here is what I've told them that I do. I do three things. I speak, I travel to where I speak, and I have fun. And anything else that needs to be done, one of you people do that. Don't get me involved. Um, and sometimes they'll leave me a voicemail or send me an email and they'll ask me something and I'll send it back to the whole team and say, somehow this mistakenly got to me because I only do three things. Speak, travel, fun. Figure this shit out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. If you don't have an assistant, you are one. And I, again, can, this, this resonates so strongly with me. And it was a, it was a game changer for me, certainly as we continue to scale our business. And, and what I want to do is make the distinction here between what people will may traditionally know as an executive assistant and somebody there who's printing out emails, coming in with the newspapers, and, you know, in that traditional sense. For me, what I, we hired young graduates who were a little bit unsure as to the direction of their lives. They were very competent, brilliant attitude, but just weren't at this point uh, heading to find a career that that they wanted to commit to, uh, but they wanted experiences, and I hired them on the basis that look, you will you will get exposed to everything here. I just want you to have the humility to make coffee, and and the the ability and capacity and compassion to deal with the first minister, for example, who would you know the the the, the highest the highest um, state officials and everything in between. I can't give you a job description, but what I can assure you is that you're going to get exposed to every facet and every corner of this business. And at the end of 12 months, I promise you, if you, you know, come to this with a brilliant attitude, the humility and a capacity to learn and grow, then there will be opportunities for you within this business. And it was just a wonderful experience both for me and for for those people who we would term, you know, traditionally as executive assistants, but basically there was somebody there to support you. There were, I got to the stage where those people were able to think even beyond where they, they, they could be where my thought pattern was about to be. <laughs> they were always one step ahead. Let, 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 uh, hats off to you, high five on that. That is one of those answers because an awful lot of people would say, well, that's fine for him to say because he can afford to pay these assistants. But you found a creative way to make it digestible um, by leveraging uh, those type of, type of resources. We just need to put our thinking cap on on how can we do this. Let me give you an age-old example from Jack. At 12 years old, I took a newspaper route over from a kid that had it before me. It was 32 customers. Now, I was really gifted in selling. And so a year later, my route was 275 customers. I'm in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, living in that area. Now, the weather is similar to Ireland, and so sometimes it's cold and wet and snow and all of that type of thing. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to school during the day. I'm in the dark delivering these papers. I have no time to sell anymore. 
and I'm doing this job that I hate, delivering papers. So I figured out you had to be 12 to have a newspaper out. So I hired five kids that were under 12, and I gave them the 275 papers and distributed it and said, I'll split the money 50-50 with you. And then I was able to sell again because I didn't have to deliver the damn papers. Those was, were my first five assistants, right? And I've had assistants my whole life. I met my first wife when I was a fifth, I was 16 and she was 15. And, uh, and we got married two months shy of 21. Before we got married, I had the hard conversation with Bonnie and said, look, we're different in a very, in a very big way. And I think that's part of the attraction. So I want us to each promise to not try to change each other. And she said, I'm good with that. And I said, you gave it too quick of an answer. So let me go a little deeper. Uh, I will never do anything around the house. I will never own a toolbox. I'll never have a hammer in my hand. Now, if you don't want to do it, I'll always figure out how to make money to afford to outsource it, to get somebody else to come in and do these things. But don't expect me to be doing that type of stuff. It's not part of my 168. Uh, I, I, I am going to work on the things that are being the highest value, what I call high payoff activities. And a high payoff activity, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be any good at it, and it's not going to give me any psychic joy, and it's eating into my 168. I'm very protective of this 168. I, I just love that, and you recite that beautiful story. Uh, and what a what a, a wonderful foundation in entrepreneurialism. The, as a 12 year old paper boy, in your great book, the listeners of the podcast won't be able to see this, but I encourage everyone to go out and get this Hyper Sales Growth. It's a book that I wish I had come across years ago when we were developing. Uh, seeking to develop and grow a high-performing sales team. So, you know, I want to I want to get in with that. You you know, you structure this book, which I would expect from somebody with a with a very um, a, a very strong financial background. You're structured, you're disciplined. There's a beautiful structure to the book, and you begin by uh, highlighting and amplifying the importance of culture by design as opposed to culture by default as the bedrock of building a high-performing sales team. Can you just share with the listeners, Jack, what you mean by that? So, so the first order of business I really want to make sure that I explain is this. The title of the book is Hyper Sales Growth. What's interesting about it is that it's in three parts. The first part is on culture. The second part is on sales management. And the third part is on sales. So if a salesperson were to pick up the book, they, it, it, unless they skip to the third part at the back of the book, they're wondering, well, when is he going to talk about sales? So I didn't make a mistake in that order. I put them in the order of priority, right? So here's the thing that I say. If you don't get the culture right in your business, everything else that goes on is harder. If you get the culture right, everything else that goes on gets that much easier. What we're able to do with a strong design culture is leverage all of the people that are employed by the company to take their performance up by themselves to another level. That's what culture enables companies to do. And you know, nobody knows anything about business better than Peter Drucker did. And Drucker was famous for saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? And, and yet, here's the thing, Brandon, when I get with my CEOs and I'm doing my coaching, uh, I hear the words, our people are our most important ingredient, our key differentiator is our culture, all of that mumbo jumbo stuff. And then I go, okay, well, that, if that's true, um, I want you to put your time as a leader into one, and put them into these five barrels, right? Um, how much time do you spend on the sales side of your company? Not selling, but with the salespeople in some capacity. What's, what percent of time is spent on the operations side of the house? So we got the promise makers, and then the operations is the promise keepers. Then how much time is spent on the strategic side of your business? How much time is spent on the financial side of your business? And then how much time do you spend on the culture side of your business? And most CEOs, and leaders in business, if they answer that correctly and add up the hundred, 
amongst those five bu buckets, the one with the least amount of time is culture. So if it's so darn important, why aren't you investing more time in it? And I'll give you the answer to that question. Because people and companies tend to underperform to their capabilities because we rush to the urgent at the expense of the important. That's the key. You see, when I look at culture, um, there's nothing urgent about it. But it's the game changer. It is the absolute critical game changer. So here's the four legs to a strong culture. One, recognition systems. People are starving for recognition. Find ways to recognize the people in your company. Second, communication systems. The number one complaint of employees is tends to be, I wish I knew more about what was going on. I wish I knew more about where we were going. I wish I knew more about how we're doing. Uh, what are your proactive communication systems? Third, personal and professional development processes. Answering this question, why should I come to your company to begin with? And once there, why should I stay? So what's in it for me as an employee to be affiliated with your company? And by the way, Brendan, when I, when I give that to my, my clients, what they hear is professional development. I think you're missing the goal. Personal development, taking an interest in every employee and understanding where they want to go in life. What do they want to do? And how can I facilitate that, enable you to really opti optimize your life? Um, and then the fourth is empowerment processes. Creating an environment in the business where people who work in your company feel that they can make decisions as if they owned the company, right? Uh, and, and if we get those four legs in order, the people that we employ in our business, they'll run your business and take it to places that you couldn't even imagine <sighs> in a timeline, right? There's so much gold and I would encourage the listeners to go back and, and listen to, to this again because you've given a beautiful, clean, crisp structure, Jack, and it starts, you open up this chapter and I just love this quote because we talked about assistance earlier and, and you know, your focus on delegating those activities that aren't high performing activities, the high payoff activities, the ones that don't fit within those um, uh, those things that you want to do in the 168 hours. But importantly, you said there is no job that can't be delegated, which is consistent with what you previously said, except recognizing your people. And I, and I love that. And I want to get into that because you have some, you have some really, really practical tips about recognizing your people. And something that stood out for me, and I've interviewed some amazing leaders uh, in, in, the, in the course of the podcast and when we were writing our book as well. And this cropped up as a consistent theme, handwritten notes. Give our listeners the insight to the importance of handwritten notes when it comes to recognition, Jack. Uh, look, if you're in a leadership position and you were to just jot down something that said, Brendan, I was riding into work today and I thought about how well our company's grown in the last decade. And you've been with us eight of those years in the last 10. And, you know, I gotta tell you, I hear it from our customers all the time, how terrific you are to work with. I hear it from your fellow employees, how terrific you are to work with. And I just wanted to thank you, mate. You're making such an impact and a difference and just know that I appreciate you. And then I sign it with my name and leave it on your desk when you come into work that day. I, I think that's a game changer. Uh, uh, I, 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 I spoke in Chicago to 275 business leaders for four hours on just culture. And when I finished, a gentleman came up to me and he said, Jack, you were spot on. I'm a second generation owner of my company. My dad died prematurely. We were absolutely shocked. The family looked at me and said, you're the guy. And, uh, and uh, that same year, an employee in our company passed away. I went to the funeral. The family invited anybody at the funeral to come back to the house for sandwiches. 
I went to the guy's house. I had never been there before. And I was walking down to use the toilet. And on the wall were two eight and a half by 11 frames with two handwritten notes that my dad had given to that employee over two decades ago. Wow. Wow. I, 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 look, I, there's a lot of things we can do, Brendan, on recognition. But the impact that that has is enormous and long lasting. Um, uh, I, I, I've got this very ambitious bucket list. One of the items I checked off just a couple of years ago was visit all the presidential libraries in the US. So um, it, it, it doesn't matter what party you are, and today is election day in the US, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, whoever makes it into the presidency has leadership uh, attributes. And uh, that's a learning lab for me. When I, I toured all of the libraries of the presidents in the United States, and one of the things that I found was so many of them write handwritten notes in significant quantities. Now, if I were to get a handwritten note from the president of the United States, I think I'd be showing it to other people. I think I'd be framing it, putting it up in my office or wherever. Um, I'm not suggesting that the leaders of the company are presidents of the United States, but in a way, you have a position of authority that people respect. And if you can leverage that and give joy to somebody by saying, hey, I really appreciate you, it, it's, it's so impactful. So my largest sales force was 2,600 salespeople. And one of my goals was at least 100 people every month would get a handwritten note from me saying thanks. And my personal assistant, Gloria, I asked her to keep track and tell me where I stood at the 10th and 20th of the month. So on the 20th of the month, she'd say, you've only written 37 handwritten notes. If you're going to hit the 100, you better get hopping, right? So I had a process. I had a system to ensure those handwritten notes were being taken care of. Yeah. yeah. And we, we come to the importance of process and systems. Just, just digging a little bit deeper on the importance of, of communication. And this goes back, you know, we opened up the, the podcast with, you know, it, it, we're both very much aligned on the importance of setting goals, you know, in the context of an organization. You know, it's what is the big goal? What's the moonshot vision? Where are we going? Where are we trying to land here? You know, what what is what impact are we trying to make in the context of the our own scale X framework? Our second principle is purpose and vision. And I'd love to get your experience and the importance of communicating that purpose and vision. Some of the challenges I hear from the CEOs that I coach through the program and coach on an individual basis is that you know they they think because we talk about it a lot that that everyone is tired of them you know they think they think people are tired of listening to this can you share with the listeners your experience of this jack and the importance of communicating your purpose and vision yeah so so i, I, I i'm not going to lose the question but i want to add a piece to the last discussion we had on the yeah. handwritten notes on the personal side of our life right so uh, I have a new wife of three years now. Her name is Karen, and uh, she runs a, a very successful large business that causes her to travel somewhat extensively, and I travel extensively. If I'm going out of town and she's going to stay in town, and let's say my trip is for seven days, I will find a way to leave five handwritten um, um, cards, note cards, love notes, and I'll put them in her underwear drawer, I'll put one in the oven, the refrigerator, the spice rack. And so all during the week, she's discovering these little love notes. Um, and, um, and, and if she's going out of town, I slip them in to different places in her luggage so that she finds them. And if I have to, I'll put dates, do not open before this date, so that she's not taking all five notes down at the same time. Uh, I, I was married the first time for 47 years. Bonnie and I were doing, I was doing that with Bonnie in the 47th year. It's just a part of my process of ongoing showing love, appreciation, because I know how impactful that can be. 
Jack, you've raised the bar for every man listening to this. We're <laughs> we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> So, yeah, let's go, let's go over to that, that vision thing. You can't get there unless you know what there is. Yeah. Yeah. As an employee, I can't help achieve the vision unless I know what the vision is. How do I contribute to that vision? Uh, uh, look, let, let me do it this way. This is as simple as I can make it. You're living in the house next to mine. We're friends. You look out the front window and you see me loading up my car with luggage. And uh, the, the trunk, the boot is filled already. Now we're still loading junk luggage into the back seat. You come out and say, hey, Jack, uh, looks like you're going away. Where are you headed? I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, how long are you going to be going away for? Uh, I, I haven't really figured that out yet either. Man, I uh, like how, how much do you budget for that journey? Um, I, I haven't figured that out either. Uh, I just figure I'm going to get in the car today and make it up as I go along. Hey, Brendan, you want to come? <laughs> I don't think anybody's joining that journey. Well, as a leader, if you don't explain where you're headed as a company, you're asking your employees to jump in the car and make it up as we go along. It is as easy as that. Yeah. And here's what I think that that vision is all about. Something that gets people inside the company and outside the company excited about where we're headed. I'm of the belief that no one really only wants to work for a paycheck. I think they want to be involved in something that excites them. That gets them up out of bed and says, hot damn, let's go do this. Right? <laughs> whatever that is, whatever there is, whatever this is. And I, I'm going to talk about it all the time. As the leader, I won't start a meeting without saying, before we get started, let's talk about and remind ourselves where the vision is. What is the vision? What are we trying to accomplish, right? Um, I have a client today that's 38 years in business that I'm coaching. And in that 38 years, the company has grown to about $180 million in annual revenue. It's not bad, right? But the son is now running the company, and he enlisted my help and said, in the next eight years, I want to get to $500 million. And so that was like, all right, now well, that's his vision. Uh, I get that. And then when I started working for two months on his business, I went to him and I said, hey, so Mike, uh, if, if we could get to 500 million in four years instead of eight, would that be like good or bad? And he started laughing and he said, I'd love it if we could get there in four. And I said, I think we can get there in four. Let's get there. Now, all we need to do is make sure that we always are communicating 500 million. So it's on t shirts, it's on banners and posters, and every, I, nobody can talk about anything unless they're talking about 500 million. Uh, what I say is that when I had my own companies, I never went to work in the company as it existed today. I went to the company that I was building in my vision, and I pulled the rest of the organization there. Uh, I lived in my future state, not my present state. Yeah. I, I, I love that. Again, there's so much in that, and we're so aligned, you know, you the challenge that I hear from CEOs a lot is we can't get the people and and I always challenge them and invite them to explain to me to to um, I say I'm gonna listen to you for the next number of minutes. Now excite me about where you're going. Excite me about the journey that you're taking. Really inspire me and get me get the hair standing in the back of my head. Because if you can do that, then people haven't gone away. They've just gone to somewhere else where the hers are standing in the back of their head. And if it's not, they're looking for somebody somewhere else. And that's that's a real opportunity for the business leaders. They must, you know, they must inspire themselves first. And I I I also use the car analogy and I I think of the the startup phase as that that wild road trip where you are jumping in the car, you're not really sure of where you're going. It's exciting. You call around for your friends. There's, you know, 
it's the loud music's on, there's a, you know, there's excitement and really not knowing where you're going to end up. Scaling up is very, very different. It's an organized bus tour and you have mapped out clearly where you're going. And that doesn't mean to say there's going to be detours on the way, there's going to be obstacles on the road, there's going to be detours and you're going to, you know, and you just, you know, you're going to have, you're going to fill that bus with competent people who, when you hit those detours, can provide you with solutions as to how to navigate around them. But everyone's excited because there's clarity in where you're going. And I use that distinction between the wild road trip and the, and the, uh, the organized tour in the, in the context of scale up and, and, and startup. So, hey, Bre hey, Brenda, before you go, to, to go wherever you're going, uh, in, in 1985, I moved to Southern California for the weather, right? Uh, I was on the East Coast, I built some companies, and I said, if I, if I can build them over there, I can build them on the other side. So I moved here with a wife and two kids, and I didn't know any when I arrived. I brought three people with me, and the four of us started building the companies. 18 months later, all organic growth, no acquisition, 750 people in 22 locations in the U.S. But here is the message. The message is, I said to every single employee, uh, I read this book that just came out back in 85 called Built to Last by a guy that no one knew the name of, Jim Collins. And in, the, in that book, he introduced a term called a BHAG, a big, airy, audacious goal. So on my way to California, I decided I was going to create a BHAG. And what, what that was was this. The four of us are going to build the biggest mortgage company in all of Orange County, California. And Orange County, California at the time, one out of every 100 people in America lived in Orange County, California. And what was already there was Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Searson American Express, Countrywide Funding, all these behemoth organizations. And Jack and his band of three guys are going to come and we're going to be the biggest. And I gave myself three years to do it in our 14th month. We were the number one mortgage company in Orange County. And then all I did is take the template of what caused us to do that there and put it in 20 more states. Yeah. So it was the vision. It was getting everybody excited. You want to talk about hair standing up on your neck? I mean, holy mackerel. And so then as we're reporting every month the progress and I'm going, this company's in sight, this company's in sight. It's like you and I doing a triathlon and getting right behind a guy and you see his age and you they go, I'm going to take him out and you pass him by. <laughs> and all of a sudden you go, all right, let's go look for the next guy. That's the same thing we're doing with our business. Jack, when are you creating your next company? Because I want to come along. It's, uh, you've, you've been inspired. It's, it's wonderful. Some of, the, some of the things that I hear, just before I, uh, we get into the importance of processes and systems, because it's something you address again in your book, and I know you, you really amplify the importance of process and systems, and you've, you know, and you've mentioned now the importance of process a number of times in this podcast. Uh, just in that, the context of the, the announcing the, you know, what you, the, the Jim Collins term, the big hurry at the issue school, we call it moonshot. You know, that 10 year vision of the future, North Star, what, whatever you wish to call it, that end destination, you're going to get really inspired and excited about. What we find is in the, in, once, we, once we encourage the CEO to say, look, you know, if we're having a quiet beer on a Friday night and you're really disclosed to me, your big, big vision, what is it? What is it you really want to do? And, and people in this part of the world are a little bit more reserved and maybe after a couple of drinks, they will disclose what they really want to achieve and say, yes, that's it. Now, when, it's, when, you, when you begin to encourage them to disclose this publicly, uh, that's when the wall of terror hits. See, that's when they start to get a little bit anxious. The fear of judgment creeps in, um, that, that anxiety about what people will think. He's gone mad. He's just announced this big goal. He's going to send the thing over the cliff. How do you deal with all of that? That uh, the, the, the kind of the, the whispers at the, the edges saying the daily guy's nuts. Do you hear what he's trying to do now? Yeah. So, so there's, there's two really good answers, I think, to that from my perspective. Um, one is th that's no different than a salesperson uh, telling me that they're going to run into objections. On the, on, on the call, right? 
Well, the best way to deal for objections is to be prepared before you get them. Yeah. Uh, there, there aren't many objections that you're going to encounter. So if there's less than 10 objections in sales, why not go and brainstorm what the best answers would be and practice those answers, right? So if I'm the leader and I think that I've got this big, hairy, audacious goal that people are going to poo-poo and tell me that I've lost my marbles, well, then what are those objections? Where are they going to come from? And then anticipate them and tee them up. Say, I'm sure that some of you out there are thinking, what did he have for breakfast? It poisoned his brain. Uh, and I'll make fun of myself and say, now let me tell you why this makes some sense. And so when my message of why this makes sense is, I will have done my homework and I'll find four or five illustrative companies that have done pretty much that in their own industry, right? So if I were to kind of say, uh, uh, Digital Equipment Corp, DEC. Now you're too young to remember that company, but that was a company that competed back in the 60s with IBM. But the CEO of the company went, went said, um, the, the personal computers, the desktops were just coming out and Microsoft was brand new and all. And, and Ken Olson, the president of the company said, um, the, that that's a fail. Uh, there's no reason why anybody needs a computer on their desk, right? Uh, and and so uh, what happens is DEC is gone, but Microsoft is alive and well. Uh, Apple is alive and well. Uh, and so you know, as 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 Bill Gates stood up in front of people and said, "This is what I want to create," or Steve Jobs, it was so cutting edge. But look at where they've come to. Uh, uh, Netflix, in the U.S., you couldn't find an intersection without a Blockbuster store. And Blockbuster has one store left. It's a, it's a travel destination showing people how they used to rent movies. And Netflix is worth billions of dollars. So I'm going to use four or five examples of people that were thinking crazy that went on to do incredible things, Right. Um, uh, I've, on, I've been on stage eight times with Sir Richard Branson. Uh, and, you know, if you sit with Richard Branson over lunch, as I have, uh, you walk away thinking, how many drugs is he on and what are they? Uh, <laughs> the guy's talking about doing crazy stuff. But then five years later, he's got a company that's doing it. You know, yeah. um, Elon Musk is a great example of a crazy man, right? Uh, and and these, are the guy, these are the game changers. So when I say I'm going to, in 1985, come to California and build the number one mortgage banking company in Orange County, I'm going to take examples from that period of time and show people, look at that, and look at this, and look at that. I, I, I would tell you Jeff Bezos probably was a crazy man, too. Uh, you know, uh, Tony Shea at Zappos was a crazy man, too. And so the examples are all around us. Yeah. Why I, I, not be one? I, I, I love that. Hold on, that's, that's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer to that is this. I ask every one of my clients, paint the picture. If you can draw what you're building, what your vision is, if you can put it on paper and draw it, you can have that all over the company. You can have it as a screensaver on everybody's computer. This is where we're headed. Regular reminders, painted the picture, right? And so I literally had the 48 states drawn and where we were headed and how long it was going to take us and how many people and how many locations. And it was all, here's what the company is, the one that I go into every day, even though we're only 12 people or whatever, right? Yeah. And they, uh, look, people laugh at me. It's okay. Uh, yeah. It's okay. No, I, I, I love that again. It's a concept that we introduced to our CEOs, uh, socialized by Cameron Hurled and, and a guy that I interviewed on this podcast, the Vivid Vision, and uh, you know the work that he did with Brian Scudamore. I just love the, the painted picture, Jack. I, I, I love that you brought that up, and and something that you mentioned there, that you know deal with the objections up front. Again, I go back to season one. Actually, one of the, it was the second or third episode with Professor Damien Hughes. And he mentioned when I posed a similar question, he says, conduct a pre-mortem. We're always conducting post-mortems. Conduct a pre-mortem. Get those objections, nice. those obstacles up front. 
and, and address them head on. So, so love that. I want to, I want to touch on the, the uh, dive into the importance of processes and systems. And again, we come back, you know, this is a conversation around creating high performance within your sales teams. We've touched on culture. We're getting into processes and systems. We haven't got into the, the, the tactical aspects of selling. And this is the order in which, again, Jack lays them out in his wonderful book, Hyper Sales Growth. So just uh, give an overview, Jack, if you wish, uh, if you will, please, of the importance of putting processes and systems in place in the context of enabling high-performing sales teams. Yeah, I'm going to do it really easy and relatively quick. Lovely. I love that. Simple skills, complex fields. <laughs> <laughs> 2,600 salespeople in over 100 locations. Every time I visited a location, I had some similar words to share. Here were some of them. There aren't 2,600 best ways to sell this stuff. What do you say we figure out the best way? Build the systems and processes, practice the systems and processes, and I bet you we kick the ass of anybody we compete with. Uh, that, that's as simple as I can make it. Sports teams are run better than most businesses. That should be painful for a business person to hear, but it's absolutely true. What do they have that differentiates us from business? One, they have a playbook. That's the systems and processes. There isn't a coach in any sport at any level that would consider putting the players on the field without a playbook. But it's interesting because when I wrote Hyper Sales Growth, we were inundated with literally hundreds and hundreds of calls from companies saying, help me take my company to the next level. And I'd say, send me your playbook and I'll build the next level up. 98 out of every 100 companies that contacted me could not send me a playbook. Therefore, they don't have systems and processes. Where if you don't have a playbook, that means that every salesperson in your organization is doing it their own way. Can you imagine running a sports team that way? Go out and see if you can get open and I'll look for you. This is crazy, crazy thinking. So one thing sports teams do better is they have systems and process, they have a playbook. The second thing is they practice, 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 practice. I would challenge anybody that's listening to this podcast and say, how often are your salespeople practicing how are they practicing and where are they practicing? And the answer that you're going to find in most companies is they're practicing on real deals. They're practicing in the game. Uh, there's no the sports coach that would ever go into a game without practice, practice, practice. Um, and the third thing is they have an active coach, an active coach that's on the field interacting with the players on a regular basis. I don't want a sales manager, I don't want a sales manager sitting in an office behind a computer. That is bullshit. I need my salespeople out there with their sales leader feeling a sense of what it is to go out and compete effectively. Yeah, this is this is the point in terms of in terms of practicing. And it's a point you amplify in your book, Jack. And I've seen it time and time again, too many of the salespeople certainly that I've come in contact with are too keen to go in with the brochure uh, and it's now digital and it's on their iPad and they're keen to open up their iPad and show uh, and talk a lot and show all of the features of this wonderful product or service that they're, they're presenting. And at the base of the little four stage model that you've presented, you're, you highlight the importance of listening. You know, and you make the point that you have never known a salesperson to fail because they've listened more than they've talked. Can you speak to that? Yeah, um, I'm going to do it even more emphatically. And anybody that's in sales that hears this is going to really be set back. Stop selling. That is the best advice I could give a salesperson. People do not want to be sold. So if I'm a salesperson and I just heard that, I'm like, what is this wacko talking about? That's what they pay me to do, go out and sell. Um, put yourself in the shoes of the prospect. You don't enjoy having a salesperson try to sell you stuff. So why would you think it changes when you're wearing the salesperson's hat? So all I want you to do is just a subtle change. Here's the subtle change. Instead of selling people something, help them to buy. 
the subtle difference between selling someone something and helping them to buy it is profound. Help them with their needs, help them with their opportunities, help them with their problems, help them with their pain. Look, that's why people buy is because they want to get out of where they're at. Uh, and if your product or service can do that, then you're on your way. The only way you can help people with their needs, opportunities, and problems is to figure out what they are. The only way you can do that is by asking questions. And so, look, I, I, I'm going to tell you uh, the, one of the greatest sales presentations I ever made. Um, so I was in the running for a large sales training contract with a very, very big company. And I had made it down to the final three finalists. And they gave the panel that was going to be making the decision, there were five people on the panel, they gave each of the three contestants an hour to go in and pitch. So my mental state said, uh, I, I, if I put together a PowerPoint presentation or I put together some kind of dog and pony show, that's exactly what the other two are going to do. So therefore, we're just blended together and I don't stand out. So I'm going with no PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to put myself in the shoes of the five people making the decision. And if I were on their side of the table, what questions might I have of the person that I'm going to choose? So I came up with what I called the top 10 questions if I were in your shoes. So I walked in on the presentation and I said, look, um, I could go for this hour and give you one heck of a presentation on my capabilities, but you know what? I don't think that's helping you in the decision process because the other two contestants are probably gonna do the same thing and then you gotta sort through it all. So what I try to do is think about it from your perspective. I came up with 10 questions if I were in the decision making and let me give you those questions and answers. And I'm gonna leave 15 minutes at the end of my 45 minutes for you to ask me whatever else you want. And so uh, I just took over with questions and answers. And after 45 minutes, the five of them are looking amongst each other, like what the hell just happened? And it was clear that I won that contract that day without even leaving the room. I found a way to differentiate. I thought through from the prospect's mental state and how I could align with what we were bringing to the table. Yeah. All I want salespeople to do is be better prepared. Today, in the selling world, we have incredible technology. We can go onto their website and we can learn where their pain points are, where their vision is, what they're trying to accomplish. We can go on LinkedIn and Facebook and social media and learn more about the decision makers, what turns them on and, and, and what, uh, uh, like the, the, the stuff that you can accumulate beforehand to enable you to come up with the best questions. Remember my 13 year old story as a caddy. I spent a couple days thinking through what are the questions I wanna ask these golfers about and how they became successful. And I then practiced the questions, and then based upon the course layout, where would be the best opportunity to ask the different questions, right? So that is a salesperson preparing before the call and finding a way to differentiate from everybody else out there. Yeah, I, I just love that. You know, flip the lens, help. And that when, you, when you're scaling a business, ultimately, the very essence of scaling with purpose is to bring your wonderful product or service to as wide an audience as possible and to flip that lens, to reframe it. It's not selling, it's connecting. It's connecting the buyer with your product or service. And in order to do that, you've got to identify what they're struggling with, you know, and and solve a problem or service a need. And I, I, I hey, just let me, love let that. Me let me take it to just a higher level. The highest level that you can get to is this. 30% of all of the leads that come into me to hire me, I give to other people because I think they're a better fit. Uh, and, and, and so I'm trying to help them in their challenges, even if it means not me. Yeah. Now, I can tell you what that's translated into. 90% of my business is repeat referrals. 
that's a beautiful place to be. Um, and by the way, we didn't even talk about price, and I need to go soon here. But but um, uh, if if you do the right thing by people, price doesn't matter any yeah. longer because yeah. you increase trust, right? If I if if you call me and, and we had this happen yesterday, someone wanted to hire me to do a customer service presentation. And I said, I know a guy that does customer service better than I do. I mean, he's the expert. Use him. Well, a year from now, that same client may call me up and say, I want you to work with my salespeople. They're not calling me any other sales trainer or speaker. They're going to call me. Why? Because they trust me. Because if I would give business away uh, because I think that they're better suited somewhere else, man, if he decides to do the job for me, he's the best guy for it. Right? Oh, brilliant. Before we move into our close, uh, it would be remiss of me if you it, just literally in 60 seconds, if you could share with our listeners the ABCs of hiring great talent, because certainly when we were scaling, it was one of the biggest challenges that I had at, at bringing a, those A players into the business. Yeah, so 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 you, you and I, look, Brendan, we hear it all the time, really hard to find good salespeople, really hard to find good salespeople. And I go, really? Is it hard to find them? Are you looking for them? Yeah, I'm looking for them. Perfect. Show me the list. There isn't a guy that has a list. If you don't have a list, you ain't looking. What you're saying is, wouldn't it be great if I came into the office and two top salespeople were showing up in there and saying, are you hiring? That's not a good process. So the first order of business is you need a list. I want you to think about that analogy with sports teams. Sports teams are run better than most businesses. There isn't a coach out there that doesn't have a recruiting list. Right? They're fully staffed. They don't have any openings, but they're always recruiting. You always have room for top producers. So the first order of business is you need to put together a list. And even a small company ought to have a list of at least 15 candidates. Um, and then identify what makes a great salesperson in your company and industry. What I'm not talking about is a job description. I'm not a big fan of job descriptions. You want to know what job description is? Here you go for sales. Win new customers and grow the ones you got. We're done. Okay? So that's the job description. What I'm looking for, what are the personal attributes and qualities of historically what makes a good salesperson in my business? So you build a one-page bullet point profile of what that salesperson looks like, and you give it out to everybody in the community and say, I've got this kick-ass vision. I'm delivering with purpose. I've got an amazing culture, and I'm looking for cats that look like this. And by the way, they don't even need to be in our industry. We'll teach them the industry, right? So what does the profile look like? The biggest number one thing for salespeople, grit. Never, ever, ever give up. I don't care how many times in a marathon I fall down. All I know is I need to get up one more time than the number I fell down. That's it. There isn't been a, and by the way, I've not done 93 marathons. I've done 100 now, right? And I'm telling you, every one of the marathons, I wanted to quit somewhere along the way. Don't hire people with the quit gene. Hire people <laughs> with the gene that says they never give up, never quit. You've heard it from the, the world's number one sales trainer. Hire for grit, uh, not quit. So... I, I, I love that, Jack. Look, we, I, I want to be respectful of your time. You have experienced 73 incredible years on this planet, experienced more. You experienced more in 12 months than, than many people do in a, in a lifetime. And we've just established today that you're just past middle age. So uh, what, what can you leave with our audience we, in, in the context of three timeless takeaways? So we've already covered, we covered all three in some ways. The number one, ask questions and listen. That's number one. Number two, stop selling, help people to buy. And the third is focus precedes success. When I talk about focus precedes success, high payoff activities, and here's the bonus, too many salespeople call on too many people that don't deserve to be called on. The better salespeople actually call on less people and they write more business. The key is they're calling on the right people. Have you analyzed your marketplace and are you investing your 168 hours 
on the people that are the best fit for your product service and for you. Jack, you have been an absolute inspiration today. I want to thank you for your incredible energy, for your wonderful wisdom, for your uh, immense experience in sharing that with our listeners today. There's so much value in, in what you've given over the last 75 minutes. If people want to connect with you, Jack, how best to reach you? Um, so um, uh, I really want to encourage people to go to my website on my newest book, which is Jack Daly's Life by Design.com because half the book is there for you to download at no cost. Okay. Uh, so if you don't want to read the front half, the back half is on the website and all the forms and templates to design your life we've given on the website. So Jack Daly's Life by Design.com. And the other website is Jack Daly's Sales.com. Right. Uh, and, 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 and if you want to email me, it's Jack at jackdailysales.com. Ah, wonderful, Jack. Uh, we will put links to your websites, to those uh, respective websites on the show notes of the podcast. What's next for you? Uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be focusing on life by design, and I'm going after two distinct groups. I'm going after couples, and I'm going after kids. And those, that's where my, uh, my next 10 years are going to be focused on is giving people a roadmap to lead an incredible, exceptional life. Oh. Uh, I've, I found my understudy, and I'm going to be handing over in the next 18 months my sales and sales management culture business and, uh, and go have some fun with couples and kids. Oh, yeah. oh, brilliant. And also, you have a little bit of training to do for the marathon with your grandson in another 15 years. So uh, get busy with that. Jack, thank you again. I have enjoyed today immensely. Take care.